Great question, and it serves you very well, by the way, in, the, in these settings. It's a great interviewer voice. I appreciate it, yeah. Um, I've always wondered, though. <laughs> <laughs>a lot of folks have commented that I have a deep voice. As director of the Johns Hopkins Voice Center, I'd like to ask you anatomically why that is. Fundamental frequency, so pitch of somebody's voice when they're not trying to go high, trying to go low, is a representation of the mass of the vocal cord. Okay. The more mass there is in the vibrating structure, the lower the frequency of vibration, the lower the pitch of the voice. Uh -huh. So generally speaking, that tracks by size, it tracks by age, it tracks by gender, but certainly there's a a spectrum and I would imagine that your lower pitched voice is a representation of the fact that your vocal folds anatomically are probably larger than oh. most other people's. You've written about uh, how the bell curve um, applies to medical performance. Uh, how should doctors and patients work together to make sure that they're at the positive end of that? It's a great question um, and I thought that the entire idea of it was somewhat fascinating because I think oftentimes we don't like to admit to ourselves mm. that there is a bell curve and and statistically, most of us are smack dab in the middle of it. That's sure. kind of how it works. Yeah. Um, we all want to think that we're at the uh, the positive extreme. Uh, every patient wants to think that their doctor is the best. And uh, not every patient can be right because, again, statistically, right. by definition, most of us are right in the middle of the bell curve. At an individual level, it means how can I connect with my patient mm. to make sure that not only is the treatment plan as optimized as it can be, but is there compliance with it? Mm. Sure. optimal how can I get buy-in how can I convince them that it's not okay to accept good if together we're trying to shoot for great the video laryngoscopy mm -hmm. can you tell us a bit about how it works and what you use it for it's the best teaching tool I have because if I can show a person his or her vocal cords on the TV screen mm -hmm. and we look at the monitor together and I'm saying here's open here's closed here's how they vibrate wow. here's what we're dealing with yeah. and I empower them I educate them as to what's going on now we're working as a team. Now we're together figuring out how we're going to get them back from a quality point of view to meeting their occupational social voice needs. The most powerful tool we have, because I do this a lot, <laughs> and it gets yeah. me so far with the patients, but what gets me the rest of the way is, hey, let's take a look at the TV screen. Let's look at the video together. Um, it's extraordinarily powerful in my follow-up patients, so my cancer patients, my papilloma patients, mm. ones with chronic illness where it may come back. Yeah. The ability to say, here's what you look like today, here's what you look like last time. You know, I mean, if a picture is worth a thousand words and a video is worth a million, and when you can play the two videos side by side, from a buy-in point of view, it becomes far less mysterious, mm -hmm. and, and it's not the voice of the uh, disembodied expert saying, you need to do this, you need to do that. It's them realizing as they look at what I'm looking at, mm -hmm. that together we're going to decide what makes the most sense. Dr. X, thank you so much for your time. My pleasure. Thank you. That was a closed-work look.